Season 2 of The Next Unicorns is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Get $50 off your first job post at linkedin.com slash unicorn. Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. And Embroker. The Embroker Startup Insurance Program helps startups secure the most important lines of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Go to Embroker.com slash Angel and get 10% off by using code ANGEL10. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. It's your boy, Jake Hal here. We're doing our next Unicorn series. I think it's the second or third one we've done. And it's been a great series because we find companies that you may or may not have heard of depending on how deep in the industry you are. These are not companies that have hit that billion dollar mark yet, but that are expected to. And you can tell they're going to do that because of the scale of the company, whether it's the number of people or the investors, how much they've raised or candidly, the vision of the product and how it's growing. And this has been an incredible season. We've had some of the the best guests we've ever had on the podcast. Uh, people were freaking out about uh, Cody Friesen's Zero Mass Water, uh, episode six, uh, and David Blake from Degreed uh, did great on the pod. Everybody loved that episode, number six in the next unicorns, and Daphne Kohler, of course. Just tons of great people on the podcast, and today will be no different. Our guest today uh, spent five years at Apple and 150 days in World of Warcraft. I kid you not, if you add up all the mittens, it may even be more now, we'll find out. Um, and he worked uh, in visual design uh, at Apple, uh, worked a little bit on the M&A team and, and, and led the design team for Apple TV, actually. So we'll hear a little bit about that. And his company is Caffeine.TV. He's a lifelong hacker from Down Under. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Ben Kieran. Thank you, Jason. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to talk and make a new friend from Down Under. I'm uh, obviously obsessed with uh, Australia. Spent a lot of time there. I've been there now four times, I think, uh, and, j- and just love my time there. But you had a dream growing up as a coder slash nerd slash BBS sysop, which nobody even knows what a sysop is. But you started as um, basically a hacker uh, in the 90s or so. Uh, when did you first get introduced to technology and how did that lead you uh, to the United States and fulfilling your dream of coming to the Bay Area? Yeah, so uh, early, uh, early 90s, around 91, 92, when I was uh, roughly 10 years old, um, a family friend gave me a programming book and um, I started teaching myself C++ and I got into BBSs and I just, I don't know, love at first sight, just loved building things on computers and, uh, and just have just stuck with that passion and it, it just fo- followed the journey. Fantastic. And, and what actually got you to make the flight? Tell me about that first flight and coming to the United States. Well, do you, rem- do you remember it well? I, 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 it actually, um, I think the thing that prompted me, the thing that got me over here initially was if you remember the O'Reilly conferences that used to be at the Absolutely. airport in Marriott. Yeah. So, so they, uh, they invited me to speak and it was sort of like an opportunity to, to, to come over here, basically. It was your coming out party. You literally came over for an O'Reilly conference. People forget about those O'Reilly books. And a lot of people around the world had their introduction from those books because pre that, the information wasn't on YouTube. YouTube didn't exist. Um, and I just met somebody this weekend socially and he said, you don't remember where we first met? And I said, no, remind me. And he said... We were both at Foo Camp, um, Friends of O'Reilly, the second one, which was maybe 15, 16, 17 years ago. It's probably 2004 ish. But what was the what conference you came and spoke at? And what did you speak about? Well, it was about uh, the first company I, I was working on, which was a social messaging service, uh, kind of like WhatsApp, but from almost like 20 years ago. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. And what platform was it built on? Uh, It was a Java app that people could download. It supported mid-P1 and mid-P2. It was a 63 kilobyte, almost XHTML browser um, that worked on like 250 different phones because of how I designed it. And uh, it allowed people to have very rich messaging functionality on these these very early feature phones. We're talking about like the Nokias and the sidekicks of the world that had like really crummy browsers that 
were, you know, sipping data at a very low rate? Yeah, I mean, I started on like, um, well, I started messing around with the Ericsson T39, which didn't have a Java footprint, but then the the Ericsson, I think T60 and and beyond T65, and then there was a lot of Nokia phones and yeah. um, Motorola handsets that started to run the Epoch operating system and supported mm. Java. Um, yeah, that that was what I was sort of playing around with. And it's mind blowing. Uh, like I just remember those times when people take out their flip phone and you could actually like send an SMS, which America weirdly was far behind Europe and Asia on SMS messaging. And when it came to America, people were like, wow, there's a world of possibilities, isn't it? Totally. I mean, I, um, you know, in high school in Australia, uh, people were like in the late 90s, uh, you know, playing Snake and texting and doing all of that. And then when I came yeah. over with Blue Pulse, people were like really surprised to hear about messaging on, on mobile phones in the early 2000s. It, it sort of yeah. blew people away. Which is, I think, why they asked me to come talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And you worked on that for a couple of years. You got some backing for it. And then you were ousted, if I remember correctly, if I heard on another podcast. I, I was. Tell us that story. <laughs> well- that's, that's always a great story to have on your- a, a great um, you know, thing to happen on your first startup. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I, um, I dropped out of, out of university and moved to the States. And um, you know, it was my passion and it was my identity. It was, it was everything to me, building, building the company. Um, it got to a certain point where uh, the investors didn't, uh, well, they really wanted me to monetize it. And mm. we didn't have a sort of a common vision around that. And, um, and so, uh, in a fairly nice way, although it's never that nice, I was you know, asked to get out of the company. So, really, it was, a hard, it was a hard moment. It was a very hard moment. But uh, When they do that, how do the yeah. VCs do it? Do they, they call you on the phone or they say, let's go for a walk and then you get whacked like in Goodfellas? How does it go down? Well, for, for, it's uh, for me. It was a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a multi-step process. So it started off as, "Hey, let's let's have dinner," <laughs> and so, <laughs> look out. And so have dinner, and then sort of talk. No through, agenda. <laughs> no agenda. Let's just talk. No through, agenda. <laughs> let's talk through things, and then uh, you know, a couple more conversations on. You're like, okay, I see where you guys want to go, and why that might be better for the company. And yeah, was and, it and ultimately that, better for the company? Well, the co the company ended up not not working out, and so yeah. I, you know I'm not going to say, hey, it would have all been perfect if I'd stayed around or anything, but it didn't work out a couple of years later after me, and it was it was painful, but it's all part of the scar tissue and who you become, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And you, I remember, went to work on that company. You'll remind me of the name that was doing app search because the biggest problem with app search when the app store came out was nobody could find apps. It, the only way you found an app was like if somebody wrote a blog post about it, if Engadget wrote a blog post. So you, you joined, I don't know if you founded that company or joined it, but tell the story of how that app um, store search got started and what your contribution was and then the ultimate outcome. Yeah. So I, before I was founder and CEO of Caffeine, I was the founder and CEO of an app search company called Chomp, C-H-O-M-P. And that's the company that Apple acquired. But what sort of taught me a lot about the anatomy of search technology and how to even step into building something like that. Um, I'm more of a, even though I have an engineering background, people think of me more of a, as a designer, UI, UX person. And so app, app search is definitely not for the faint hearted. It's, there's a lot, lot there. But what sort of taught me a lot about the space was between the first company and the second company, I did some consulting and advisory work for Aardvark, a social search company that Google acquired. And yes. I, I built their iPhone app uh, for them with a the team, but I led, led the effort for building their iPhone app for them. And it just taught me a lot about- uh, To find so what social, social search was at that time, because I had Mahalo at the time and we were both you know, in the same sort of vertical, which was trying to create a search engine kind of based on humans, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so their thesis was that uh, humans just have a lot more knowledge than what is on the internet and they wanted to make that searchable. Um, and mm. so they were using instant messenger to connect people up that could answer a question that you might have. And so rather than typing in keywords, you could sort of uh, issue a, a, a question you had and it would use, use natural language processing to figure out like who in your social network and their social network might have a good answer for you and connect you up really quickly. Yeah. And that got bought by Google and then it just kind of disappeared i guess well it was I, like I, one of those acquisitions what, what, what did it get blended into like google keep or something or i, I think it might have been google plus um ah, yes google so, plus. So, so they put a lot of work into building out you know google plus and on social and all of that and i think there was a few different companies that got sort of brought into that fold and so then you go work on chomp 
they ask you to be CEO, the, the founders of that company, or, or they bring you in or you found, co-founded it? I, I, I co-founded it. Um, so me and another uh, Australian, I was the CEO and, and, uh, and co-founder. And so I um, you know, came into that thinking that um, now that I had sort of a deeper understanding of, of, of search engines and, um, and, and how to build something like that, I sort of looked at the app uh, space HTML5 apps as well as the App Store apps, and you know uh, it was really clear to me that it was a b- big technology problem on how we were going to make it so you could do like thematical searches and more generic searches, um, given sort of the technology problems at that time. And so that was something I was really interested in, and uh, started a company about that. So when we get back from this quick break, I want to know how Apple wound up acquiring Chomp, what you learned at Apple. Uh, yeah. Working with Eddie Q and you know working on the Apple TV, even a little stint in M and A. I understand. We'll hear a little bit about that. What you can say, I know that uh, Apple's kind of secretive, but there are some broad strokes I think you can give us. And <laughs> then we'll get into Caffeine TV and how you came up with the idea and how that's going when we get back on this week's startups. Let's get down to brass tacks. LinkedIn Jobs is going to give you fifty bucks right now because you listen to this podcast. That's fifty dollars off your first job post. Terms and conditions, of course, apply because they're giving you the fifty dollars. But we get so many great testimonials from you, the loyal this week in startups audience. You tell us all the time about how you find perfect hires using LinkedIn. And one of our uh, founders who listens to this podcast, Jay, is with a company called Ten Golden Rules. It's a boutique digital marketing agency, and and he just needed another account manager. Sometimes your business is growing, you need an account manager. You need somebody to manage all of these fabulous accounts and things are going well for Jay over at 10 Golden Rules. And after he identified his two top targets, Jay noticed, oh, LinkedIn, yum, yum. He's got a mutual connection. You know what that means? You can do a quick reference check. And that's what Jay did. And then Jay was able to hire a great account manager over Zoom through the power of LinkedIn. And you know that power that LinkedIn has because they have over 690 million members across the world. I mean, it is the standard. If you want to find great people, you just go to LinkedIn. You know it. And they screen all the candidates for the hard and the soft skills you're looking for while putting your job post in front of the most qualified members every day. They get that repetition and they're looking for jobs like yours. And sometimes you might even get a passive job seeker. LinkedIn.com slash unicorn. You're listening to the next unicorns. You're getting 50 bucks off. 5-0. Fitty. From your boy, Jay Cal, and from our friends at LinkedIn, just go to linkedin.com slash unicorn and get that $50 off your first job posting terms and conditions apply because they're going to give you $50 for just typing in this URL, linkedin.com. It's already in your browser cache. You know, linkedin.com is in there. All you got to do is put a slash unicorn at the end and then you get the 50 bucks. That easy. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. It's our next Unicorn series. Uh, This is the seventh of 10 episodes we're doing, uh, thanks to our sponsors for allowing This Week in Startups to grow and uh, hit three times a week. It's incredible. The podcast is growing massively, and we're getting incredible guests. Today is no different uh, with Ben Kieran on, who is the CEO and co-founder of Caffeine.tv, which we're about to hear about. uh, As his story leads us to Chomp being acquired by Apple. So. Apple was fascinated with your search engine um, doing app search because let's face it, the app stores and Apple wasn't very good at search. There was a rumor they were going to get into search engines at some point. They were dancing around. I had actually shown Steve Jobs Mahalo.com early on uh, and and he was fascinated by search, but they just went with the Google deal and they had a great partnership for some period of time uh, until Android came out and <laughs> Steve Jobs wasn't too happy about that. But they acquired your company. What is the process of Apple acquiring your company like? Because it's very rare. They, have a, they very much have a not built here culture. They like to build their own stuff, not buy companies. Sometimes they buy an enabling technology, which I think is how they looked at yours, Ben. But, but tell me about that process. How does Apple... We heard how you get whacked as CEO. They invite you to dinner. What's the equivalent when Apple, you know, cuts you the check and says, "Come join the team"? Because they're, I don't want to say they're snobby, but they have a very high standard. Would be, I think, we both agree, correct? Absolutely. I think it, it was uh, it, it, when Steve was there. It was it was even harder, probably, to to get acquired, or at least you didn't hear about it very often when when they right. happened. Um, but uh, for us. You know, we we really did uh, and and had a measurable way of just showing how much better our search was than than all of the existing app stores, even Google's Google Play. Um, we had very measurable like PhDs with statisticians like like 
very measurable ways of looking at how much better our, our click-through rates would be and our search quality. Um, and so what we found was that by partnering with companies, we had a, a, a partnership with Yahoo at one point, we had a partnership with Sony Ericsson to power search, app search for them. And so we were talking, while we did have a, a way to just use the service through a website or through our own app, um, we were trying to partner with Apple to power search for them and show them just how much better the search would be if they included our technology. And sort of through those discussions, that's how they ended up saying, we don't want to, we don't want to partner with you. We'd like to, to buy the company. What's it like when you're sitting there in that meeting and who says that to you? Is like Eddie Q says it to you or some like M&A type person, a business development person says, uh, we'd like to acquire your company. And they say, would you consider selling your company? What is the exact words they say? Yep. And how do they even put that on the table? What's the, what's the, what's the moment like? Well, it, all of the sort of partnership conversations were happening with an Apple engineering team and, and our team, which was pretty much all, all engineering. Mm. And, and so there was probably like six months of conversation on and off and they'd come up and visit our office and we'd go down to Cupertino and everybody got to know everybody. And then just at some point, the engineering uh, boss, who I, I, I won't say his name, I want to respect yeah. Apple's privacy, but sure. you know, one of the engineering bosses said to us, hey, like, have you ever thought about selling the company? Like, would you consider that? And if you'd like to have that discussion, you know, why don't you come meet Eddie and some of the other guys? And so that's kind of how it sort of began um, the conversations around that. And it's- I don't know, for me, like my dream's always been to build something standalone. Like I didn't ever uh. really want to get purchased, but I also have always kept in mind when building, this is my third venture back startup, Caffeine, I've always kept in mind that, hey, there's a lot of partners, there's a lot of investors, there's a team, there's a whole lot of people you've got to think about and do what's best for the company. And for, yeah. for Chomp, I do think it made a lot of sense to reach the maximum number of people to get included in Apple's App Store and other services. And also, you know, it's very interesting when you think about it. The first one, they booted you. So that's like a strikeout. The second one, I mean, getting bought by Apple is a big deal, right? Like they have the highest standard in the industry, but it probably would amount to a, a double or triple in terms of financially for the investors. It wouldn't be like the massive home run, but it, it, was, it was decent for them and for you. Yeah, I think it was. I think that's yeah. a good way of putting it. I think it was a, you know... It was good. What yeah. did you learn inside of Apple? What makes that company, when you look back on your five years there, because I know you were there for four years and they, they actually gave you credit for that year of when you started Chomp, which I thought was interesting. To make it to the five-year mark is pretty special. They give you that nice certificate signed by Steve Jobs, or I don't know if you could get it by Steve Jobs because I think it would have passed on at that time. Yeah, had he, he, passed? He, yeah. He, he had passed, unfortunately. So yeah, mine, mine's yeah. from Tim. Yeah. Ah, were you but there when he passed? Um, or right he, after? R just right after. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember where you were when you heard the news? I do actually. Yeah. I was uh so Chomp was operating out of it um uh it was almost a garage. It wasn't a garage, but almost a garage in San Francisco just down the road from where Twitter is today. And I got the news and I actually burst into tears. I was physically yeah. ups, you know, I was really upset about it, as I'm sure many 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 people were. Yeah. What what was it? that for you as a kid from Australia who got into coding, that what did he mean to you? Like, what did his, his life's work mean to you? I think that he was somebody that really stood for building something really, 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 really great that he and the team believed in. Like, you know, we're not going to just sort of copy or do the status mm. quo, but like really just hyper passionate and hyper believed that they were going to do something um, just just beyond what we've seen in, in the past. And there's, you know, guys like Walt Disney, there's, there's like a few people like that that are real heroes to me for sure. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I love that. I find it super inspiring and there's just a lot to learn. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it meant to me. Yeah, the conviction level and the extreme pursuit of excellence, you know, like we're going to paint the back of the fence, you know, kind of that they talked about, like the inside that you don't see is going to be as good as the outside. It was a level of determination for excellence that you just don't see, right? Yeah. Everybody's trying to compromise. He was just a non-compromising individual. You, you never got to meet him in person, I take it. No, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Super intense. Like when you were in his aura, you know, like he just walked up to me at a conference, the D conference at one point, and he just looked at me and he saw my badge and he goes, I read Engadget every day. It's my favorite blog. And it was just like, he had a, he had a certain intensity to him and 
Then one time I said to him, you know, Steve, I have a question for you. Why, why doesn't the iPad play the iPod play like short videos? Like you could put like the Chappelle show or like SNL videos on it. And he looked me directly in the eyes. And he said, Jason, nobody wants to look at a postage size stamp video. And I said, you know, Steve, I don't, I kind of would like if it was just like a short skit of like an SNL thing, I think people would watch a music video. And he's like, Jason, nobody wants to watch a post I sent video. And I just said, uh, you know what? You're right. You know what happened two months later? <laughs> you launched a video iPod. <laughs> it's just like, you're not the guy you want to play poker with. Because I was so convinced I was an idiot at that moment. I was, like, I was so young and I just said to myself, my God, I'm an idiot. I just said something stupid to Steve Jobs. He's going to think I'm an idiot. And like, I'm a confident guy, but it, he kind of like made me question my own North Star. And then I started coming out and I was like, oh, I get it. He, he wanted to keep that so close to the vest. Um, but you, you got to work on Apple TV and you got to watch Eddie Q do his work. And, you, and they even had you like run a design team. So what's, what's the magic at Apple around design? Like what did you, as somebody who was good at design already, did they make you a better designer? And if so, how? And, and what is it about their philosophy that results in such extraordinary products, products that you instantly know are Apple products? Yeah. So I, I think that, um, you know, there's a very, very strong culture there of everybody wanting to be in the details and, and, and everybody wanting to make it simple and everybody wanting to make it clear and everybody wanting to make it understandable and very human and, and ultimately something just really special for, for customers. And, and so when you've got like a whole culture and company and everybody's kind of in that, that mindset and turning up whatever they're working on, um, the design team plays a really special role in all of that. They're the ones that are actually showing the pixels that are working on the pixels that are really getting into that user experience. Um, and, uh, and the expectation is that everybody's going to talk and discuss and, and be involved at such fidelity and such a level that I've never seen it like that in, 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 anywhere else. It was, it was phenomenal. It was f mm. absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. How do they keep things under wraps so well? Like, what is the conversation they have with you of like, hey, secrecy is important because it seems like everybody buys into it. And when I was at Engadget, we would get leaks from Motorola or, you know, just basically every company was like leak central. And Apple was like Fort Knox. Like you just, nobody gave it up. The only way anything ever came out was like somebody in the supply chain would give us something once in a while, like a leak. But well, how do they maintain that culture, do you think? Well, I, I think that um, the, the, the way in which Apple TV was done, and I can't speak for all of the different yeah. you know, pro products there, but not everybody knows about everything that's going on. Ah, uh, they silo things. And, and so, the teams that have ownership over particular aspects of it, they really want to keep it close. It's a, it's a secret and it, they're mm. excited about it and they can't wait to tell you. In fact, one of the things that- I believe somebody at Apple said to me early on when joining the company was that when Apple ships a new product, it's like, it's like Christmas. People are so excited to open the surprise. And then they, somebody looked at me and was just like, so, so you don't want to ruin Christmas, do you? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> so you want to ruin Christmas for everybody? It's so yeah. great. And so it's when so it, great. You, and so, that and so, makes sense. Yeah. And so when everybody's thinking that way, you know, they're, they're just super excited to keep things a secret and-, yeah. and and enjoy the process to ultimately figure out what is the absolute coolest, most amazing thing we could do for a customer. Um, and, and that's kind of in the, you know, there's a lot that goes into making that happen. A lot of things that have to happen and come together to, to, to deliver on that, to really execute on it. But that's the culture. It's really in the DNA there. That's super special. Hey, when we get back from this break, you launched your company on April 1st on the 40th anniversary of the launch of Apple itself, which is an incredible tribute. And I want to understand uh, how you came up with the idea for caffeine.tv. Uh, and do you call it caffeine or just caffeine or caffeine TV? I know the, the URL is caffeine.tv. It's just caffeine. It's just caffeine. So when we yeah. get back, I want to know what was the inspiration for caffeine and how it's going when we get back on this week's startups. All right. This deal from Vanta is so good. I want to start my ad read with it. Vanta is giving our Twist listeners, think about this, $1,000 off their first sock too by going to vanta.com slash twist. 
That's not a joke. $1,000 off. Vanta. V-A-N-T-A dot com slash twist. So why is SOC 2 compliance so critically important? Well, if you don't have your SOC 2 buttoned up, you can't close major customers because major customers have security concerns, and they should. And if you already have your SOC 2 report, don't you want to make it easier to maintain it year after year after year? Of course you do. Well, Vanta's software continuously tests against technical and non-technical SOC 2 requirements. They partner with over a dozen audit firms who have been trained to file SOC 2 reports directly within Vanta. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three, four, five months if you're not using Vanta. You'd be crazy not to use Vanta. I just had a twist listener. You guys and gals are so good to me. You tell me when you use the products and you always use those promo codes. Super important. Well, I had John Hegrains, uh, who's the founder and CEO of a drone startup. It's called Kitty Hawk. Everybody knows that they've raised a lot of money. Super important company. Uh, and he said Vanta was essential in helping them get their SOC 2 compliancy set up and maintained. And he loves the tie-ins with Google, Slack, GitHub, and AWS, which is really essential for Kitty Hawk's business. Use Vanta, people, and get that $1,000 off just like Notion, Lattice, user testing, and hundreds of other successful companies who got their SOC 2 reports with Vanta in weeks, not months. Unlock those sales and give your employees all that time back in their calendar to work on more business critical assignments. There's so much you got to get done right now. Use an expert. That expert is Vanta. And they're giving Twist listeners $1,000 off their subscription at Vanta.com slash Twist. I don't know how long they're going to keep this going. So I want you to take advantage of it right now. Vanta.com slash Twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Ben Kieran is with us. And he is the CEO and co-founder of Caffeine. Thanks for taking us down memory lane, uh, Ben. That was just awesome. And uh, so tell me, uh, you what is Caffeine and how is it going? What's the vision there? Caffeine is... Uh, a website it's an app uh, that users can come to and watch a whole new world of live it's all live streams and broadcasts so it has everything from gaming to live battle rap to live sports content and people can watch it in a social interactive way Um, and it's a whole new experience you know for creating and watching all of that and and so you've raised $250 $250 million. So something is going on here that's very special. Uh, and something is scaling. And I think it's really esports. At, at the end of the day, is that 80, 90% of what you're doing is just esports has exploded in the last five years. And you started this exactly at that moment? You know, it, that, no, that's not, not actually the case. Um, oh, okay, great. Yeah. In fact, our most popular content is non gaming content. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. So we have we have all new streaming technology and all new chat system and all new business model. A totally different take on what I think could become the future of live television. Actually, and really? yeah, and it's something that I was really dreaming and thinking about when I was uh, at Apple, and I ultimately left Apple to to go to go and pursue. And so, what is that vision? What do you think TV is morphing into? And what is at the core of this interaction and, you know, modal change or mode change from passive, you know, channel surfing or telling Siri what you want to watch to yeah. doing it with a keyboard in front of you or on an iPhone? For sure. So, I think that over the next 10 years, live broadcasting or live broadcasting, a lot of people, particularly if you're sort of a Gen Z or Gen Y person, predominantly think of live streaming as just video gaming but i think it's going to be uh so much so much broader than that it's going to be really inclusive of all of your sports and entertainment and some of the things that you might have watched on linear tv but um also a lot of uh things that don't really have a place to live stream or a home right now so this could be like dj battles it could be drone racing it could be you know comedies fashion lifestyle skateboarding you know gaming is another thing but like um I think that that watching that experience is not just going to be a passive experience like what we had on linear TV. It's going to be an interactive and social experience. And you can see a lot of what that feels like in gaming, but I think it's going to extend way beyond gaming and start to create a whole new place, a whole new home for all of your live live broadcasting. How, how is what you're doing different than, say, Twitch, right? Twitch has gotten very big. They seem to have a big foothold in uh, streaming of games. Microsoft has some competitor. I forgot the name of it. It's the Microsoft competitor. 
Yeah, Microsoft had a, a company called Mixer, which Mixer, uh, yeah, which they switched off just recently, and oh, um, really? So, and started to push the traffic towards Facebook gaming. Actually, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, that's weird. Didn't I thought they had signed some like huge deals with gamers for Mixer, and then they just gave up? That's so weird. Well, that. that yeah, I mean, I don't know all the de- the details of it, but that's how it, it seems, you know, from mm. the, the outset. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, how does chat enhance what people are doing and watching it? And then, what's the monetization? Because I know you've taken a different route there. I know Twitch is mostly, I think, subscription. It's sort of like Patreon is the model, but yours is slightly different. Yeah, I mean, look, they they predominantly they have lots of different ways of monetizing. But uh, they predominantly have advertising and subscription, uh, and then they have a lot of other ways in which you know streamers can make money. And um, I think the way most people sort of think of them is is something that's very much embedded in gaming and gaming culture. Mm. And I think they'd love to, you know, expand on that. Um, but I think that there's a lot of reasons why it's hard to sort of expand from where they are and why I really think you need a, a, a complete reset and, a, and yeah. to sort of really reimagine the, the space. And that's what we're about is where the, you know, the alternative that's coming in with something that's almost more pop culture. It's much broader than gaming's just, a, you know, a, 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 a part of it. And, and is the monetization strategy uh, people having in chat like buying in chat items you know like there's in-game items but people are doing things in chat rooms where they give like gold or hearts or something like that or super hearts i know that's the big model in china and japan and those kind of places i think that was part of the inspiration yes yeah that that sort of gamification in-app purchase stuff that Mm -hmm. you're talking about has been really successful in asian streaming platforms but no one has really sort of successfully translated just like the primary form of monetization in the west Mm -hmm. Um, we've also seen uh, in the gaming space, you know, companies like Fortnite make as much as I think three, four billion dollars annually through these in-app purchases. Yeah. Um, and so thinking about how do you bring that model to North America, where people are watching, as I say, some gaming, but a lot of non-live gaming content together with friends, and how do we use that as a primary monetization engine? I, I definitely think there's a role and there's a place for subscription and advertising, but our model is all in-app purchase. We have new low latency streaming technology and new audience experience. We have a studio for producing really premium uh, series of content with different communities, as well as all the user generated tools for the community to come in and create their own content and get discovered. Is anybody making a lot of money doing this in-app chat stuff yet? And then how does that break down in terms of if somebody buys a $1 you know, heart and they give it to me for I'm hosting my podcast on it or I'm hosting a comedy show or a rap battle... And they give that dollar. Do you get 70 cents of that dollar and they get 30 cents or they get 70 cents and you get 30 cents? How does it work? Yeah, so we, we break. Um, so so that if you were streaming on Twitch or YouTube, you would get roughly 50% if, hmm. if you were partnered with them of the revenue yeah. and the platform would receive the other 50%. And so we have the same model in our world too. So if you came on and streamed today and people were buying in-app purchases in your stream, you would get 50% of the, the revenue as well. Um, for us, we are, you know, we, we'll see people spend as much as $600 in a night on these in-app purchases. What? We're yes. not talking about OnlyFans content. We're talking about non-adult content spending $600 in a night. Uh, wow. it's, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, we have no adult content. In fact, we, pr- wow. we, 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 we pride ourselves on creating a really safe and non-toxic uh, place for people to watch, you know, live television together, live who, TV. Who did they get? Who did a customer give six hundred dollars to? Wait, you're saying well, they, one customer gave six hundred, or in aggregate they made no, six hundred a night? A single customer, a single viewer, wow. will spend as much as that, and that's that's a regular, that's a regular thing. That's uh, the, a wow, wow. Somebody, the, what's the most somebody spent in a month then? Well, the, the the average every so we compare ourselves to YY, which is the live Chinese streaming platform um, mm. that's probably the most successful in in the world, um, and their revenue predominantly comes from this in app purchase model. Um, they have ads and subscription too, but um, it's predominantly in app purchase, and so they make on average seventy eight dollars every ninety days US dollars, and we make on average seventy eight dollars. Uh, per customer every every ninety days as well. Wow! Wait, so, and then it gets split two ways. 
Or is that your split? Then it gets split two ways. No, then it gets split two ways. And right. then if we're using somebody's content rights, if we're using like Fox Sports or we're using Red Bull or we're using the Battle Rap rights or something, then they would get a portion out of the caffeine platform ah. fee as well. Yeah. That's cool. How, does, how do rights work in video games? So if I wanted to play StarCraft 2 on Twitch or on your platform, do you have to have permission from StarCraft to do that? Or do those video game providers just see that as free marketing and getting more people to buy their games? How is that looked at? I, I think they, they really see it as sort of free marketing and mm. getting a way to sort of um, yeah, promote the games, provide a window into what the best gamers are doing with their, their content. Um, that said, um, for different gaming companies that we have a partnership you know, with, we're, we're happy to give them um, money when we make money too. Um, and, and it's just a matter of us getting out there and just forging more partnerships. We're not, it's not like some special process to come and to get a partnership with us. It's just, we need to have something in place that we can give them a revenue share. And I think they should get paid when their content streamed. Feels like that could be a, a huge game changer. If you were to say to a gaming company like Fortnite or, you know, I don't know, Starcraft two, Hey, let's do a three-way split. We'll take a third, you take a third and, and the streamer gets a third and we want an exclusive. And then they could just say to Twitch, like, hey, listen, you, you can't stream. We're giving the exclusive to Caffeine. Has that happened in your industry yet? The, the Joe Rogan exclusive, you know, that Spotify did, has the equivalent happened yet? And does Fortnite allow people to stream Fortnite or are they more keeping it close to the vest and you have to be on Fortnite to stream Fortnite? They, um, you know, I, I think every gaming company is different, but as far as I know, each of the gaming companies, including Epic and Fortnite, allow mm. everybody to stream stream their content. Um, and, you know, we have started to talk to gaming companies like, hey, we could do a revenue share with you the same way that we'll do a revenue share with Fox Sports and other content yeah. providers and really start to make a more fair opportunity for everybody to participate in the, in the revenue. All right, when we get back from this quick break, I want to know about traditional content and if that will ever play a role here, i.e., would an HBO give you Game of Thrones or <clears throat> might the NBA let you stream the playoffs if you could guarantee a certain amount of revenue when we get back on this week's service. You need business insurance for your startup. Without insurance, you failed one of the earliest tests of being a CEO of a company and being a founder because what if you get hacked? and you don't have cyber insurance, you will face an existential crisis of your company going away. And what if you're trying to get board of directors members and you're trying to have directors who are highly qualified and you don't have director's insurance and officer's insurance? You don't have that, you look like an idiot, okay? And then finally, errors and omission insurance. You maybe never heard of that, but that covers you when you make a mistake. And any big customer you're going to have is going to ask, do you have ENO insurance? Do you have director's insurance? And do you have cyber insurance? These are just simple check boxes. It does not matter if you do everything perfectly. Somebody can make a mistake and people can sue you for no reason at all. It happens. I've seen it up close and personal. So what you want to do is you want to go to imbroker.com slash angel, E-M-B-R-O-K-E-R.com slash angel, imbroker, E M. B R O K E R dot com slash angel. And while you're there, you're going to get 10% off your insurance by using the offer code angel10. And you can go from sign up to a quote and purchase in just 10 minutes. You're not dealing with large, slow incumbents. And the sign up is just going to take a couple of days, like I said, not weeks. And you don't have weeks to wait. The process is super transparent and there isn't any opaque pricing or nonsense. You're not going to have to deal with, you know, getting the runaround and, and that sticker shock when you get the price. Okay. They're going to give you a great price uh, and it's 20% lower than most of the other coverage you're going to find out there. And you're going to get that 10% off by going to imbroker.com slash angel. Thanks to the Imbroker team. Uh, make sure you use that promo code angel10. And let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Our guest today is Ben Kieran, and we are talking about Caffeine, which you can visit at caffeine.tv. Uh, how many people you got at the company now, Ben? What's the footprint like? We, we have a little over 100 people. Wow. So efficient. And then what's the usage like? What's the, what's the monthly, you know, unique users or yearly or daily? What's, what's the footprint like there? So, so we haven't released very many numbers yet but okay. uh, since since launching in november last year uh we are talking uh quite a few million uh users that are all actively using the product and super engaged mm -hmm. and we're really excited about uh how it's taking off you know we'll have a single live stream on the weekend uh battle rap is an example that 
um, can have hundreds of thousands of people concurrently on just a single stream. So wow. you should think of the community as growing uh, as fast as I've ever seen, I think, consumer companies grow. And I've been in the SF Bay area for about 15 years and looked at a lot of wow. companies um, and very, very engaged. And I think it's the quality and the interactivity and the engagement that we see that's that, that I, I'm most excited about. I think that's what's driving that, that growth. And so it'd be the equivalent for this rap battle of like being on cable TV or something, hundreds of thousands of concurrence, which is like a, a cable TV channel, maybe not broadcast yet, that's millions, but this would be hundreds of thousands uh, and would be like a good size cable channel. And that's happening every week, uh, wow. all the, like all, all, all the time. And that's just a single channel. That's before all the other, other channels. So what well. would uh, these rappers who are doing the rap battle or the production company, what, let's, you know, one of the top five people, you don't have to say specifically them. I know obviously it's confidential, but a top five uh, person who was getting hundreds of thousands of people, what would they expect to make from a session? Would they, if they were doing it weekly, would they make 10,000 a week, 100,000 a week? What could they expect in terms of monetization at that level? I don't today. have a good quick answer f for you on that. Um, it does vary based on the different different providers, yep. um, mm. but it's certainly worth their while taking it from you know the app or the website or YouTube or wherever where they were previously distributing it, or maybe even linear television, and yep. starting to, to to bring it here. So yeah. thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, something in that range. Uh, you could you could make a lot a lot more than that. Um, wow. not, but that's that's not the the common case. As I say it's it's building and it, it really it. does vary pretty widely wild, widely. Yes. What happens in the stream that causes the cash register to ring? Like, has that playbook been made where people say, Hey, if you want us to go another half hour, like the DJ saying, Hey, I'll I'll play another set. If you guys, you know, hit if I get a hundred hearts, I'll play another set. Or, you know, cam girls might do certain things if you know, to hit another set or, you know, uh, gamers might do something to, to keep going, you know, hey, what, what are those key moments that get people to actually drop money like that you've seen? Is there a moment that dropped the most cash? Like you must, there must be the top 10 moments in the history of caffeine of people just dropping huge amounts of money. Like what, what were those moments? Yeah, uh, I got to say, we, we definitely don't do the, the cam girl thing, but no we cam are- No cam girl, yes, it's 100% no, safe. We, 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 have, we have like 24 seven moderation, all sorts of things going on to really keep the content uh, fresh and exciting and right on point for what we're trying to build. But, um, you know, what, what makes it happen is um, the CDN is made out of WebRTC. And so- The content um, delivery network is made out of content RTC, delivery, which yeah, is so real time. So you're, when I say something in this conversation, there's no lag. Like on Twitch, it could be a minute or two minutes behind, depending on when you jump on the stream. It Same can thing be. with everything else, yeah. It can be. And then we've designed it so that when you sort of purchase these 3D items, which are these like beautifully crafted, culturally relevant um, 3D items that people just love playing with and using, um, the broadcaster can uh, invite the audience to buy them and uh, and influence the show in a number of different ways. So, uh -huh. you know, a, a really What's simple an example, e yeah, yeah, simple example is if you're watching a battle uh, this Saturday, um, you know, you would be able to to vote, right? So, you, it's sort of like everybody uh -huh. can vote, but you can like really pay to make some noise and make sure you're voted everybody's everybody could see who you think just won that last battle <laughs> got it oh, okay so i could drop 10 bucks or 20 bucks on a digital item that at the end of the battle i'm like he's on fire yeah like in nba jam or whatever i could say this person's on fire and do like a fireball or something exactly and people will pay 20 bucks just like people would pay i guess when they used to have american idol you could call on the phone to vote and millions of people would call and it would cost a dollar to do it Right. So they were actually, it was actually like a revenue stream that was like, they were making advertising. And the, is that like part of the inspiration too, is those dial-in television shows used to do that? Yeah, I think, I think that um, that's, a, that's a use case for sure. Like another use yeah. case is just people wanting to support the content, uh, mm -hmm. being, being like a Patreon. Um, another one is uh, the possibility of getting like a shout out, like uh, particularly if you have someone <sighs> really influential behind the, the camera and they might, you're like, like, hey, Jason, thanks so much for the props. Oh, so that's like a cameo. So you got like this cameo dynamic where somebody famous might say, you know, thanks, Jason, for the, you know, the rose or whatever. Then you have the dynamic and the device of voting. So you have voting, you have shout outs. Um, and then some people just may want to like brag like that they could afford the 
the hundred dollar item, right? Like, so there's like a, you know, showing off that you could afford it. Yeah, I, I think of it um, the way I conceptually thought of it when we were designing it was uh, almost like concessions at um, a, a, sp- a real world sporting event, right? So you have mm. a foam finger, and maybe they'll put the camera on you because you've bought a foam finger and like you're now uh. on the jumbotron or something, or maybe you just wanted to buy the jersey to show support for your team or maybe you bought like the popcorn or whatever ah. because it, you know it enhanced your own enjoyment and so i was really thinking about those kinds of use cases and how to bring that to live television that's fascinating i never thought that they show i never thought i never put that together that when they show somebody at the jumbotron who's wearing all of the gear they're subtly telling everybody to go visit the gear store <laughs> and buy like go buy your san francisco 49ers gear because we just put somebody on who's wearing a 49 jersey hat necklace and finger they're just trying to inspire you to do that and then, of course, supporting the artist is one. Have you ever done like a telethon or something like that where 100% goes to charity? Because that, to me, also seems like something that could work really well. Is if you did something for, you know, some, you know, I don't know, um, pandemic support or the forest fire, some tragedy happens in the world, and it would seem a natural for a telethon. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, p- people like the user generated aspect. The non-studio stuff that we produce and and make with people with content rights, um, the user-generated community does um, those kinds of things. I think often, like you probably see them once every few weeks. But we've also partnered up with companies like iHeartRadio, which we did earlier yeah. this year, and definitely raised money and um, done exactly that. Yeah. And what about live sports? What happens there? Because they're very protective of their rights. I, I've been pitched a million times on businesses that will wrap that content and allow other people to do their own play by play, which is completely illegal <laughs> from what I understand. Like you can't do play by I can't do play by play on an NBA game or an MLB game. That would be, I think, against the rules. If I monetized it or not, I guess could be a mitigating factor, but I've never invested in those businesses. But are are those leagues open to that? Like somebody, because it would be very interesting if, you know, some Boston Celtic fans, you know, who are just completely, you know, off the rails were, you know, doing their own commentary on the game, picture in a picture and people were donating to them. But then you'd have to figure out how to get the NBA to give you the rights to it. What, what do you think about sports and, and, you know, like live sports, those big leagues or even the mid-tier leagues? Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't know, but uh, but Fox is a big investor in in caffeine, yeah. and um, we actually have a, a joint venture studio with Fox, which mm. allows us to get access to different content rights that Fox Sports has. Um, ah. And then we have another arrangement in place with Disney, ESPN as well. So we've tried uh, X Games, we've had some WWE stuff on before. We did some stuff with the Super Bowl last year. Um, there's all sorts of different content opportunities that we've got access to through those strategic investments um, that you wouldn't otherwise get unless you probably paid a fortune for. And also they have to become available, those rights too, because they get stitched up for a very long time. Yeah, that's the problem is that the Super Bowl and the NBA finals and all that stuff is locked up for five years at a clip. So getting them to actually do that is kind of hard, but you can do the pregame or the postgame or stuff like that, yeah? Yeah, um, you can. I mean, we do have some like streamed live mat- matches um, mm. g- going on. Um, look, I mean, where, where the real traction has, has come from, though, is finding uh, things that we can broadcast that youth, basically youth culture is really interested in, where between our studio and our technology you know, distribution platform, we could provide something of real quality, really authentic to that community. Mm. Um, and so you take Battle Rap and like that didn't sort of feel like it had a home on linear television. Um, It's certainly something that Gen Z, Gen Y in North America are really interested in. Um, And we've been able to come in and really elevate it, not be like vulture culture, like diluted and and, and water it down, but really have the right design sensitivities to bring it to the audience in uh, just a, a, a much, much, much better way than what they had previously. And that's sort of inspiring a lot of UGC content to get created behind it. And we're sort of doing that over and over again with different properties that we can work with. Yeah, that seems to be like, it could be more fun to watch it on caffeine than to watch it on real TV because you get to actually do something. And that's like the bit, a friend of mine told me his test now is if he he'd tell if content's really good if he's not looking at his smartphone while he's watching the series. So if the series is so good that he doesn't take his phone out, 
that is his test of how quality the content is. But this allows you to sort of talk to do that while you're watching it. I think the other one that could be a very interesting category is, you know, like they have that show Talking Dead where they talk about the Walking Dead afterwards. Like yeah. people doing the post game would be amazing. Like there's a kid worldwide Wob uh, who FanDuel just hired. And every time an NBA game ends, he just goes on Periscope and talks about it. He gets thousands of people. And they're all in the Periscope chat, but the Periscope, I think the Periscope has like super hearts. It's very one dimensional, but you're creating like a library that's specific to that vertical, correct? Yeah. So we have uh, a library that is, that are, you know, culturally sensitive, feel really authentic to, you know, the community that we're working with. Uh, we have that real time feedback with the real time stream. We have a different chat experience. Uh, as I say, we can provide that professional production uh, to these live s streams that have never been available to some of these mm. communities before. And that is creating a, as I say, a new place for live broadcasting. It has a lot of gaming on there, but uh, it's, it, it, you know, the, the stuff that people are watching, it has drama, it has emotion, it's, uh, it feels very authentic to the, you know, the, the cultural community that's watching and, and, um, and buying these items in it. I just had the best idea ever. Our biggest traffic days at Engadget were um, when we had uh, the Steve Jobs keynote, when we did the Apple keynotes, we would live blog them. The, the term live blogging was coined by Peter Rojas and Ryan Block at Engadget. And we actually <laughs> built software them, for them to live blog. So they would literally do sentence by sentence. And if there was no Wi-Fi at, at the original ones, they would be sending out on their Blackberries one-liners. And then we'd be posting them into the live blog, cutting and pasting them uh, to let the world know what was happening. People just hit refresh like a thousand times on the webpage. We'd have huge traffic days. But boy, would this be perfect to do a live stream of the next Apple keynote. And you could live stream the reaction to the next iPhone or the next iPad or when the glasses come out. So tell us uh, about the AR glasses. Obviously, you worked on those. What are they all about, Ben? <laughs> well, you, they, they weren't going on when you were there. But what do you think the what do you think about AR in general in terms of this experience? Because it is very related to what you're doing. And certainly you've seen Magic Leap or, you know, the, the, the Microsoft glasses by this point. And certainly that's on your roadmap. How does this translate into AR and VR? And is, you know, how, how far away are you from doing that? We're a very long way uh, from, from doing something like that. Um, I, uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on the community that we're building to watch, you know, live broadcasting t together and, and certainly extending it, you know, f like I say, we just want gaming to be a part, a, a part of it, like really creating a home for uh, youth culture and live broadcasting and all of the things, all the topics that you can imagine young people being interested in wanting to see, see live and talk about and be together and consume together. Um, something like AR... And even even VR, if you want to come back and talk about that, that, all of those things I think do provide new content experiences for that kind of new social graph, that new social network that's starting to, I think, form around mm. people that want to watch things live together based on different interests and different topics. You know, you mentioned at the beginning my obsession with World of Warcraft and it is yeah. way more than 150 days, unfortunately. How many but days <laughs> have you been in there? I mean, I've got like... Because it tells you if you how many hours you played and then how many days that equals. So, and this game came out 20 years ago, 25? Ca came out about 16 years ago. 16 years ago. Okay. And so, so, 2004. Like, and you were on the beta. I know that. I was on the beta. And, like, my, my original character that started then has about 178 real-world days. <gasps> um, so, that's just the character I started then. But I have many other characters and I'm back playing classic WoW right now, which only came out middle of last year and that already has about th 30 days on it or something wow and <laughs> so, wow world of warcraft is 15 bucks a month it's roughly that yeah. yeah yeah so you've been playing for 15 years so you've spent three thousand dollars on world uh, of warcraft just for the fees yes. which isn't when you think about the number of hours actually if it's you've been in it, it it's actually yeah i mean it probably equals less than a dollar an hour i'm trying to just do the math here but you what is it about that game that you found so amazing? And is it's, it true that you met your spouse in World of Warcraft? No, no, no. I, I didn't meet her in World of Warcraft, but we will play World, World of Warcraft together. Um, oh, okay. But the, the, thing, um, the thing that I just love about it is that it's this sort of shared topic, this 
um, sort of fantasy, this thing that you, this community that you can join into online and, um, and everybody's got the same interest and everybody's on at the same time and everybody can interact together and make friends together and complete quests and play the video game together. And it's just a huge uh online world for doing that and so i think the same thing that happens around this kind of fantasy of world of warcraft should happen around the next generation of sports and entertainment and news and all of the live broadcasting that that, that's out there um but to build that you can't just shoehorn it into an existing gaming community like twitch you really have to think about how are you going to go and approach these different communities like battle rap and whatever the next thing is that we want to do and really make sure that it's authentic to that culture and community and has the right sensitivities to bring it to life in a way oh that God, doesn't water it down idea. i just had the best idea ben you should <laughs> hire like a bunch of crazy like left-wing and right-wing people <laughs> to do the debates. Can you imagine what people would be doing during the, the uh, presidential and vice presidential debates in terms of voting for who won the debate and throwing tomatoes at each other or just going crazy in virtual currency? I mean, do you create an editorial calendar like that? And is there somebody on the team doing that? Or is it too so, toxic? It's, uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on things that we think that youth culture in North America would be super yeah. interested in. I and think they're so, interested in the debate. Millennials and Gen Z care about that, right? They, 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 they might be. I don't know. But like the, based on sort of the people I'm talking to and interacting with and the work that we're doing, you know, mm. I'm finding success in music and entertainment and, yeah. you know, hip hop and uh, battle rap and video gaming and things like that. That's where we're going to start. I actually, I think it extends into all these things, Apple keynotes and news and politics yeah. and all that stuff. But you've really got to get that core really right, as you know, building a yeah. company and make sure that you expand from something that, that has, you know, some real it values was- and some real core. I, I, you must have seen Instagram Live go crazy during the pandemic with those kind of like rap battles. That's that's been a huge thing. But they don't they can't monetize on Instagram. There's no monetization, right? You know, there's there's no monetization. There's no sort of studio Facebook that's helping so them cheap. produce. Yeah. You know, there's uh, there's a lot of things missing from sort of creating a home out of uh, out of that that sort of form of content. But yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely um, a popular thing. Like battles. Um, live streaming you know you're Mm. seeing it pop up more than ever right now in the middle of this pandemic for sure it's so dumb like facebook has never shared revenue with any content producers and they have the biggest platform they're so dumb like youtube has created so many millionaires tens of millionaires you know people who are just worth a fortune by giving 55 percent. and zuckerberg is just so cheap he's never done it tell us about the drake partnership how did that come out and uh, we'll end on that how what is the Drake partnership? How did you get the Drake partnership? And how is the Drake partnership going? It's, it's going great. He uh, was put in touch with me through Ben Horowitz, which is one of our board members from Andreessen Horowitz. I'm sure you know him. He's a cool um, cat. He's super cool. He loves, he's a huge hip hop uh, Yeah, huge good friends fan. with Nas. He's, he's he good know, friends with Nas. He knows a lot of, lot of the people very, very well. And... Um, I was really interested in connecting with Drake because I knew that he had some interest in gaming, but I was I thought that he might be interested in developing content, like non-gaming live content for the next generation. And mm. he is. He's very interested in that. And, uh, and so, I was put in touch with him and Battle Rap is the first thing that we've sort of brought out with him. Mm. Um, and, you know, he's a guy that just really understands- uh, his fans, their values, the sort of uh, mythology, the legends behind things, like really can go deep on the unquantifiable things that um, are hard to see. Like who would who would have thought that like our first battle rap, um, sorry, second major battle rap that we did early this year was like trending number one on Twitter above UFC fighting. It, it, like they, crazy. They, they, take, they, they blow up, my friend, like I like. Twitch is never seen with gaming. Like it just, right. they, they are fire. Like they blow up. And so we've got more of that coming and more of that premium stuff coming as well as uh, more great tools for people to make their own content on caffeine and get discovered and see what else they can make on the platform. Amazing. All right, listen, uh, I've taken an hour of your time. You've been an amazing guest. Congratulations on your success. First company, you get kicked out. Second company, you get that nice single double, you get that experience of five, four years inside Apple, the mothership, learn a lot. And then here you are, caffeine raising a quarter of a billion dollars, getting hundreds of thousands of people onto live streams and an incredible bright future. It's been great to talk with you uh, and, and great to get to know you for this hour. Uh, continued success. I know you're hiring. Yes. 
what positions yes, you're sir. hiring for. And, and now you're all virtual. So wait, what happened? You guys were all in an office somewhere in San Francisco in the Bay Area? We, we were all in uh, Redwood City and then we have a couple studios uh, down in LA as well. Beautiful in Redwood City, huh? It is beautiful, but uh, we are all working from home. <laughs> it's amazing how Redwood City was like, of all the areas in the Bay Area, they were just like, yeah, you can develop apartments here, you can build buildings. And they were the one pro development place. Are you in the box building or whatever that building was that box was in? We were, we were uh, near there. Um, yeah. Um, a cu- couple of blocks away from there, yeah. but yeah, it's such it's a, a great, great area. place to be. You got five guys, you got the movie theater, all these great restaurants, but what's it been like running the company in the pandemic and work from home? Has it come natural to you or has it been challenging? Are people more productive, less productive? What's it been like? I, I, I think it's been, I think it's been challenging. Um, the, uh, for, for, we're mainly a product and engineering company. Um, and I like to, design and build things in some ways uh, similar to how I was doing it at, at, at Apple. It's a, it's a very creative space where we sort of mm. come together and we really um, benefit a lot from being in the same place together. So, it's been a bit of a challenge to figure out how to do that uh, remotely. But I do think we're starting to become more productive in some ways than what we were before. So, it's we're sort of coming up with new ways to work and seeing new opportunity there. And I think that's what you get when you have a really innovative culture and company. Vaccine uh, stu- happens tomorrow. Yeah. And everybody is 100% certain that they're not going to get it. The vaccine's 100% effective and freely available. January 1st rolls around. Everybody comes back to the office or do you feel like you're going to need to allow people to work from home uh, because they've gotten used to it? How do you think about it as a CEO and running the company? Are you, if, if, it, if it is in fact totally safe and we have like $5 free testing everywhere and we have five different vaccines available and nobody has it, there's zero deaths in the United States for three months. January 1st rolls around, you just tell everybody we're going back to the office? No, um, I think that for us, we're going to take a step back and really think about new ways of working and sort of use this as an opportunity to sort of redesign and and, and really reauthor, recreate mm. how we work together. And um, I think it's, uh, you know, for me, I've stopped sort of grieving the past and wanting to get back <laughs> to the office because I am a bit like that, um, but I'm, let, I've let, I'm letting go of that for sure and starting to really dream and think about you know, how could we be an even better and stronger team and, and really rethink how we work together, which may be an example of that. You think you're going to have people come in for a four day work week, three day work week or what? How, how do you see it going down? I don't know if you saw Reed Hastings was like, I think this is bullshit. Like we're all going to come back to work. We've lost all the creativity. We've lost all the drive. He's totally anti work from home and he's old school. Obviously, you know, he's been around for a while. Yeah. What do you, what do you, what's your best guess as to what the, the grand compromise will be? between employees and CEOs? I, I think that we've got to sort of figure out based on the different functions when we need to get people physically together and, and mm. when we don't. And what are the strengths and weaknesses around that? So, if you're operating in a studio in LA, we're going to have to get you to come in still. Um, yeah. Studio director an, has to come in, yes. <laughs> if, if you're on our engineering or design team, which is most of the company right now, then there's going to be times where we're going to want to get together and and uh, and have that that those relationships and really work on stuff together. But for the most part, they could probably do that from anywhere. And as a result, like I'm a big fan of people. I think we get their best work when their lifestyle and is great they're getting sleep like they they're able to be their most creative when they're just really vibing with their life and yeah. uh if if people could do that uh r- remotely and we could get more out of them from that from that standpoint we could ultimately build something better together It'd just be exciting to explore those opportunities and 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 think about it we might jason we we still may go back just as just as it was that's just, yeah. i'm not taking that off the table but i'm using it as a moment to really rethink and and ask yeah. you know a ton of questions and see what's possible there i, I mean yeah. it is a dicey subject too as ceos i have my own companies and like uh one of them's not remote and to think about like asking everybody, okay, now we got to go back to this. Some people might just say, you know what? I'm, I don't want to. I'm going to go yeah. work at a... And, and so now we're in a competition with other companies that are saying, hey, we're going to stay fully remote. We're going to be half remote. And so there's going to be this grand negotiation, I think, because sometimes people have moved away. They, they're not in Redwood City anymore. They're not living in San Francisco or Oakland anymore. Now they're in Napa or you know, they're in Austin. And you can't ask them to come to the office because asking them to come to the office might mean they just quit. Like, and then you, I'm concerned, I don't know if you are, about a, a, a two-tiered culture where, you know, this group of people's in the office four days a week with the CEO and the president and the COO and the CTO, 
And then this other group of people aren't. And you, you wind up having these two classes of people, the people who are close to power and the people who are further away from power. And I would be very concerned as a person who's further away from power of, hey, maybe I'm not going to have the same opportunities or voice. Because when we're all on Zoom, it's a level playing field. But when you're, you know how this goes, if half the people are on Zoom and half the people are in the room, the people in the room are going to be dictating a lot of the conversation. I don't know how that gets resolved. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that or does that worry you at all? No, I, I mean, I'm thinking about this, the same kinds of things. Yeah. In fact, it, in our board meeting just recently, we were talking about exactly this and not making second class citizens and figuring out like if you have a conference room in a physical location, how do you set it up with the virtual conference room so that people do can, can feel connected and included? And it's, it's a tough topic. I mean, I've said to our company that, look, um, we're not going back this year. So we'll, we'll come back with an update in December, but um, know that we'll do what's best for caffeine because that's what we always do here. And what's best for caffeine is thinking about how to continue to have a super creative, innovative team that wants to uh, push the limits and bring something new out in the world of broadcasting. And, um, you know, thinking about where we do that from and how we do that is a big question. And now's a great, great time to explore it. And it's a hard one for sure. And I want to take the time to really think that through for sure. Yeah, you know, it's like every... Every, the, every crisis, there's some opportunity or creativity that comes out of it. This pressure that we've all been under to stay safe and keep our families safe and not get COVID um, and, and protect our companies and keep operating because we're very privileged to work behind a keyboard. It's, it's a very interesting moment in time because then when we do go back, uh, you know, we, we don't want to leave people behind, right? Um, but people may not want to come to the office. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm super interested to see how this plays out. And I do think we actually like... It seems kind of trivial or silly, like, oh, those people are on Zoom, but maybe there is like technology of like literally having a giant, you know, projector with them in life size in the room. And then that kind of call with them projected in a major way. If we actually think about those technologies and take them seriously, maybe it does bridge the gap. I'm not sure. Uh, I've been thinking about that as well. Um, well, listen, it's been amazing to have you on the pod. Thanks for the honesty and the candidness and um, continued success and you're hiring. So uh, if you're interested, where can they go to find out about jobs? Is it caffeine.tv slash jobs or? Yeah, if they careers? go to caffeine.tv, um, there's a link uh, on the page there for careers and they Great. can check that out, see what work at Caffeine. A lot of engineering, a lot of design positions. What position um, is the hardest to fill that you need to fill right now? Like what's, what's the pressing issue? Because let's get that job filled right now. Yeah, I, th I think that... Um, the the web rtc scaling and architects uh, that have a lot of knowledge around uh packet loss and web rtc and fan out and that that kind of stuff like some latency issues right like latency keeping, issues keeping the chat action you need to see as the host you need to see the chat in real time to react to it if i can't if periscope is always like four minutes behind now and i'm just like i'm watching somebody on periscope and th they're responding to text i saw two minutes ago it, it ruins the experience. That one's that one's super d difficult, and we're pushing real limits that like like people don't even know how complicated that is. But then the other thing that might be easier to help help us find is we're looking for a great growth hacker right now to join the product team. So ah, growth hacking, um, perfect. If someone wants to come in and, and help us with that, that'd be that'd be awesome. All right, Web RTC <laughs> growth hackers, you know what to do. It's usually first name, uh, and his first name is Ben. So I'm guessing if you email Ben at caffeine.tv, it's, it's not going <laughs> to somebody in the mailroom. Uh, <laughs> continued success, Ben. Thank you so much for coming on the pod. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, watching you grow this company and hit a grand slam after a uh, third time's charm. So continued success. Thank you so much.